at ISIS Parenting in Needham, Massachusetts. With me today is Katie Goldsberry, and Katie is uh, going to be our moderator in the chat room, so thank you very much. And I'm hoping sound is okay. Did do a sound check today. Everybody uh, hearing me all right? Good. Okay. Well, let's get started. We've got a full room and questions are coming in. And uh, if this is one of the first times that you've attended, the way we work things here is I spend about uh, 10 or 15 minutes going through some sort of a breastfeeding related topic. And uh, then I spend the remaining 10 or 15 minutes answering questions. And uh, that's exactly what we'll do today. Uh, these are recorded and uh, will be posted online. And I do encourage you to look at the list of recorded topics because there's everything from uh, increasing your milk production, oversupply, overactive letdown, positions, healing sore nipples, um, introducing solid foods, bottle feeding the breastfed baby, mastitis, block ducts, you name it. I've talked about it. We've recorded it and it's right up there for you to watch at three o'clock in the morning. And don't tell me you're not up at three o'clock in the morning because I know you are. Okay, so uh, oh, we've got we've got our Tennessee contingent here today. We've been having a lot of people from Tennessee lately and I love that. Um, so today we're going to talk about nursing in public, and I'm not going to talk about legislation and regulations and rules and laws about that. That that probably would be another topic for another day. I will tell you uh, that your uh, amendment rights do enable you to breastfeed wherever you are legally allowed to be. But um, of course, most of us certainly don't want to be in situations where we're confronted and feel like we need to defend our legal right to breastfeed. So uh, my, my focus today is to talk about um, how you logistically and physically can breastfeed in a variety of, of situations so that you can get yourself and your baby positioned comfortably and you can choose your places uh, wisely where you'll feel comfortable and relaxed and, and how to kind of uh, plan your your outing or your afternoon so that you can be out and about with your baby. Um, but, you know, just a little bit of uh, general stuff as we get started. You know, why breastfeed in public? Um, well, it's pretty simple because babies get hungry. And um, uh, a lot of people will say, well, you know, gosh, why don't you just pump your milk and put it in a bottle and feed your baby a bottle of milk at the restaurant or at the mall? And that's certainly an option, and some people choose to do that. But that's not a requirement, and you don't need to feel uh, that uh, socially obligated to do that in any way. If your baby breastfeeds, that's how you feed your baby. That's how they're supposed to eat. We have breasts for one reason, and uh, they're here to feed your baby. So this might be a little bit small for you to read. On my screen, it's a little bit small. Uh, but it's a, it's a pie chart, and it's a pie diagram, and it explains uh, why women who are breastfeeding in public do so. Um, not to make a political statement, not to put you off your lunch or to tempt your husband, uh, not to invoke the devil uh, or to take part in any other rituals, but simply uh, to tend to their baby's most basic need. So that's why we do it. Okay, and uh, just like many other adorable creatures who we all love to ooh and ah when we see them feeding their babies, uh, we're mammals. We have breasts for one reason, not to sell beer or cars, but to make milk to feed our babies. And um, just like other mammals, this is how babies are supposed to eat. I love that photo in the middle. I mean, it, it really has a lot of different connotations, but... Um, we're mammals. Uh, this is a cartoon that was circulating around the internet uh, a few weeks ago. About 60 different people sent it to me, but I think it's uh, very appropriate to stick it up here. Um, people that follow me on Facebook and Twitter and listen to me talk frequently know that um, I, I do have a thing for mammals, baby mammals, and I have a Pinterest page that's all kinds of little baby mammals and so on. Um, you know, but but this is a pretty classic uh, uh caricature here. Um, this is our society. It's all Victoria's Secrets and, and Sports Illustrated and, and um, you know, breasts as sexual objects. And here's a discreet mom who's just sitting quietly on a, on a park bench, um, you know, in front of that poster. Um, we could go on and on on this topic, um, and that's not my intention here. Um, just, just to kind of, you know, make us think a little bit about what, what a skewed and bizarre society we live in. Um, but really, the point today is to talk about um, how do you get yourself out of the mindset that you need to be stuck at home 
with your baby and your special little nursing chair or nook where you have your pillow just so and your footrest just so and your remote and your phone and everything lined up uh, ready for you. And uh, it's very daunting when you've been spending time working on latching and positioning and finally managing uh, to get your baby uh, uh, connected to your breast and, and have it in a fairly comfortable manner uh, and then to think about, well, how am I going to nurse at the doctor's office or, or uh, how can I go to Bertucci's or, or go to the restaurant or go to the, um, you know, go for a walk at the park and what will I do if the baby needs to eat? How do I manage that? So my encouragement for you uh, is to get started early. Don't paint yourself in a corner and, and don't, um, by, by virtue of being home for two or three weeks without attempting any feedings in other locations, don't convince yourself that the only place you really can nurse is in your living room or in your bedroom or in your uh, in your kind of carefully set up environment. Get out early, practice nursing in a variety of different settings. Some will go smoothly, some less so. Uh, but the more you do it, the more practice you'll have and the more comfort level you'll get. So uh, as soon as the first week or two weeks, get out in different types of environments. Um, go where the moms go. So here is a picture, uh, this is an old picture uh, of, uh, looks like uh, our Brookline Center and one of our Great Beginnings New Mothers groups at the end of the, the uh, series. We always do a group photo. Um, that's me in the brown shirt, <laughs> the one person not holding a baby. Um, looks like it's summertime because I look kind of tan. And um, this is an ideal uh, look, environment to practice feeding in, in other environments. Um, of course, in our centers, we've got comfortable floor chairs and nursing pillows and so on. Um, but that's OK. Go where the moms go because you'll feel comfortable being around other moms and babies, even if they're not also breastfeeding. Some may be nursing, some may be bottle feeding. Uh, but you're still around other moms and babies. And babies cry, and they need their diapers changed, and so on. And um, Places like that would be a mom and baby yoga class or um, a, uh, a community-based moms group, um, a, uh, a informal play group, story time at the local library or bookstore. Even though your baby may be far too young at, at two months or four months to get much out of story time, it's just a way of being out in a very uh, parent and child-centered, friendly environment. And that's really uh, the point here, is to get out on a regular basis. It, um, and to sit next to you and smile at you and so on. And it won't make you feel as alone. Um, some logistical tips. So I think particularly when your baby is very young and you're nursing at home and you're accustomed to your footstool and your nursing pillow, um, trying to figure out how you're going to get positioned in other places is tricky. Uh, one suggestion I have is uh, when you are on, on the bench in the mall, put your stroller in front of you so this woman uh, doesn't have her stroller set up the way I would suggest um, for my trick here. But put your, park your stroller in front of you and then put the brakes on the stroller and now you've got the stroller in front of you it's a little bit of a of a physical barrier so it may make you feel a little bit um, you know protected or, uh, or or covered a little bit and then you can put your feet up on the wheel or on the basket or on the stroller frame and that will serve as your footstool so with the brakes on the stroller's not going to move and now you can put your your feet up a little bit like a footstool, which helps angle your hips better. And then even though you don't have a nursing pillow, you can use makeshift alternatives. So here are some examples. You can take your, um, your diaper bag and tuck your diaper bag under your thigh. And if you're comfortable sitting uh, uh, Indian style or cross-legged, that can help too. But if you tuck the diaper bag underneath your thigh, it will help shift the leg up a little bit. And then uh, that gives your, your arm support so that when the baby is nursing in the cross cradle position, uh, the baby is higher up for you. Another trick or suggestion is to take your jacket, your sweater, uh, and fold that up and use that as your nursing pillow. So putting the diaper bag next to you as well uh, may serve as a support for your arm if that's easier for you. So use what you've got uh, to make yourself more comfortable. And a rolled up receiving blanket may be all that's needed to support the baby's head or to support your baby's wrist. 
Okay. Uh, when you are out and about and nursing, what's it look like? Why, you know, why do we and why should we feel self-conscious? Well, I suggest practicing at home and uh, look in the mirror or ask your partner or a family member or friend to take a few pictures with your digital camera so that you can see what you look like when you are nursing and that will help you feel more confident too. I think uh, especially when a baby is really, really young and you're spending a few minutes just trying to get the baby to latch on and the baby of course is red faced and screaming and flailing and their arms are moving around and your milk is flying and you know yeah you're going to be sweating bullets wherever you are but you know once you get the baby latched on take a deep breath take another deep breath roll your shoulders drop your shoulders pick up your head look around you know if you're out somewhere you know, look around. I think the more, uh, you know, the more hunched over and, and um, self-conscious and hidden you feel, you know, it, it kind of feeds into itself. So once you get your baby latched on and comfortable, pick your head up and just continue your conversation um, or, uh, you know, people watch or do whatever it is you need to do. Um, I'm a fan of these nursing tanks, which were not around when my kids were, were, uh, were nursing. My, my youngest is now 15. Um, and um, I think these are, are great for a variety of reasons, uh, primarily because it turns any shirt into a nursing shirt. You lift, it up, you lift up your t-shirt from the bottom um, and the nursing tank will still keep your midriff, your belly, your muffin top covered. And that's nice in the summer. Um, uh, it's nice in the winter because it will keep you warm. Um, and you can see the mom on the right hand side here in the orange tank top. She's got two tank tops on. So I think she's at one of our groups here at ISIS. Uh, I think it was a yoga class. But um, the, gray t the gray tank underneath is her nursing tank. So she's got the one shirt up and then she's completely covered with the other tank. But you can see even um, the mom on the left hand side here in the dark colored shirt, uh, her baby looks like he's latched on fine and um, there's, you know, there's really nothing much you can see from the front. So I think that uh, it's useful when you when you see what you look like nursing, you realize, um, oh, I'll, I'll pull my t-shirt down a little bit more on the side next time or, oh, there's really nothing much to see. A lot of times people walk by and smile at you um, because they see you holding a baby and they think the baby is sleeping. In fact, a lot of people will come over and, and want to see the baby and then be embarrassed or realize that you're nursing. Um, often another mom will smile at you. Smile back, you know, it's, it's positive. Um, some other logistical tips. Uh, so where are some good places to nurse? Earlier I mentioned, um, you know, going where moms go and think about places that are family friendly and child friendly. So maybe not, um, you know, the most expensive fancy restaurant in town when you've got a, a one month old baby, but a family style restaurant. And um, if you are going to a restaurant, where's the best place to sit? Frankly, that's up to you. So uh, if they show you to a table right in the middle of the restaurant and you think you'd be more comfortable sitting off to the side or in the back or in the corner, just simply ask to be seated at a, at a table that you prefer. Um, and now a question about whether or not you're going to be better off in a booth or at a table with a chair. Now some people like booths because they're padded um, and they feel like the table is going to give them a little bit more discretion and so on. Uh, and you're you know kind of usually tucked off to the side when you're in a booth. But uh, some people, especially if you're larger, uh, if you have large breasts or a bigger baby, you may not have enough room to maneuver uh, nursing in a booth. So if that's the case and they try to seat you in a booth, just ask for a table. So you'll need to experiment with whether a chair or a booth is going to be more comfortable for you to nurse in. But make sure that you practice both. Um, and then just you know ask uh, when you're seated. Ask for where you want to sit. Um, libraries and bookstores are great places uh, to feed. And the children's section of a, a Barnes & Noble, for example, uh, is a good place to go. Also, a lot of libraries and bookstores usually have uh, like an upholstered chair, a club chair, or something like that uh, tucked at the end of an aisle. And that's a perfect perfectly comfortable place to sit and nurse. Uh, one of my favorite places to nurse when my kids were young were in the furniture department at the Bloomingdale's at the local mall during the weekdays because there was never anybody there shopping, you know, at, at two o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon in the furniture department. And I would just pick a nice leather couch and sit down and get comfortable. And the sales guy would walk by and he'd see me and see what I was doing. He'd just keep going and so on. And, um, you know, so, so think about where you are, uh, where might be comfortable. Um, fitting rooms, if you're, if you're, feeling like you need more privacy or if you're if you're um, exclusively pumping and you're out and about and you feel like you need a place to pump, uh, whether you're breastfeeding or pumping, uh, a fitting room 
might be a good alternative, certainly to a bathroom. I, I would never recommend breastfeeding in a bathroom stall or pumping in a bathroom stall. Some anchor stores in, in nice malls uh, will have what's called a ladies' lounge, which is kind of an anteroom to the restroom. Uh, and it's just a space uh, where there's usually some couches and chairs. Um, and uh, you'll find a lot of moms sitting there and nursing and feeding their babies um, during the weekdays. But not in a toilet stall, please. A fitting room is, is useful. Don't ask permission. Never go up to a sales clerk and say, may I feed your baby in the fitting room? Never put somebody in charge of where you can or may not feed your baby. Um, if you if you need uh, someone to open the fitting room door for you, just take a shirt off the, sh off the rack um, and let her open the fitting room and use the handicap stall because there's usually more space for the stroller and there's usually a bench in there or a chair in there uh, and just, you know, set up shop for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then, as I mentioned, power and numbers. So, um, you know, join a new moms group, get together with other moms, uh, go for walks, sit together and, and feed the babies together. And uh, you'll feel like, uh, you know, more secure. Um, I had a nice story where uh, in our in our groups at ISIS, usually the moms, we send the moms, it's actually part of our curriculum, although moms may or may not know that, uh, we send them out before or after group on a weekly basis so they get comfortable being out and about with their babies in a variety of settings, as well as being able to make those more, um, you know, informal connections and get to know each other uh, outside the classroom and have more in-depth conversations. But um, I had a mom tell me uh, a few weeks ago that she, um, uh, she and her partner went out for brunch uh, on the weekend. The baby was, I think, three or, three or four weeks old. Uh, and the partner said, oh, are you, you know, are you sure that we can go out? What if he cries? What if he needs to eat? And the mom said, oh, it'll be fine. If he cries, I'll soothe him. If he needs to eat, I'll nurse him. And it'll be fine because I went out to lunch. I went to Bertucci's with my mom's group last week, and, and I'm comfortable doing it now. So she practiced, and she knew that there was power in numbers and that uh, it would be a place that she felt comfortable, and that's the way to do it. You choose your places wisely so you know um, you know that you're going to be in an environment that's comfortable for you. Coffee shops, I used to say coffee shops are great, but these days uh, it seems like every coffee shop is simply um, you know a 20-somethings working office and uh, good luck finding uh, a place to sit down with your baby in a coffee shop these days. It's just full of people and their laptops. Um, but a park, uh, a, uh, a mall bench uh, is also a nice option, especially if there's a quieter area of the mall, like a, uh, a hallway that's not as trafficked, that might be a good place to set yourself up to, to feed. Okay, so to cover or not to cover, that's really your choice. Um, I'm not a huge fan of, of covering, of nursing covers, but I know that some people are more modest than others. Um, I do like the, these baby Olay or Hooter Hider style nursing covers um, versus throwing a receiving blanket over you um, because what I like is that you can look down and see the baby and the baby can look up and see you. Uh, it's very lightweight cotton, so there's plenty of air getting in. Um, but even so, I mean, it does look like you're wearing a big smock or an apron um, and uh, it doesn't hide what you're doing. It just, um, and, you know, it just gives you uh, more discretion, I suppose. Uh, people know what's going on underneath there. But um, if it makes you feel more comfortable, then there you go. Uh, I think a good place for those. then you would feel comfortable using a nursing cover. Um, but, you know, when you're, when you're um, out and about and you've practiced nursing in different settings and so on, um, then just feed, just, just uh, try to get comfortable feeding as you are. Um, but again, it's just, you know, it's a personal preference. Uh, I'm going back because one thing I wanted to mention, yeah, I didn't cover this one. Plan one daily outing and build in your rest and refuel. What I mean by that is please don't get yourself into the habit of thinking that you need to feed your baby and then race out and do all your errands and race back home so you're back home within two hours in case your baby is going to need to eat again. Instead, plan your outings with a rest and refuel uh, set up in there. So say, for example, uh, first you're going to go and return something at the store, then you're going to go to the post office. Then you're going to go to um, uh, the sandwich 
you know, the, the Panera or whatever, and get a cold drink or some lunch for yourself, sit and feed the baby, let the baby come out of the stroller or the car seat, uh, change the baby's diaper if you need to, and then pack yourself and your baby back up, continue your errand, go to the supermarket, and then go home. So you might have been out for four or five hours, and there was a planned break in the middle where you knew where you were going to be able to sit, feed your baby, feed yourself, use the restroom, and so on. That's what I mean by plan your one daily outing, because if you're a brand new mom and you have a young baby under three or four uh, months old, one outing a day is pretty much all you can manage. So build in your time for, uh, for feeding and resting. Um, slings and carriers can be really helpful. So you can use uh, an ergo or a front pack or a little baby style soft carrier and breastfeed in that um, and then other types of slings. And again, using a sling takes a little bit of practice. So breastfeeding in the, in the carrier takes a little bit of practice, but it's worth it. Um, Getting up and walking around with the baby, nursing in the sling is advanced um, baby wearing and nursing. But by all means, um, you know, using the sling as a way to help support the baby and also a little bit as a as a nursing cover uh, can be useful, even if you're just getting started practicing with that. Now, if you have, uh, you know, kind of classic five, six, seven month old babies, especially around five months old, seems to be the big age of distraction. And that's where babies uh, used to focus on nursing, but now just pull off uh, every other minute to see what's going on in the room. If they hear a noise, maybe you used to be able to watch TV or talk on the phone while you were nursing. And now your baby, you know, keeps pulling off to see what's going on and grabbing at the phone and so on. Uh, my suggestion is to try breastfeeding before you leave the house. Uh, if you're going to play group and you know that your baby is going to be distracted and not have a good feeding there, then try uh, offering to nurse just before you leave, even if they just ate an hour ago, at least you're offering, um, and, um, and maybe that will hold them over. And then if you are out and about and the baby wants to feed, if they're pulling on and off and on and off uh, and they can't focus and stay on, I have this little saying, three strikes and you're out. So um, if they're just so busy that they can't get down to business, they're probably not that hungry. And if it's annoying you too much, that they keep pulling off and leaving you exposed and flapping in the breeze, um, then give them several opportunities. But you know, if they strike out, you know, button up your shirt and go on with your errand or your day. Uh, and chances are, in 20 or 30 minutes, they'll be hungry, er, and they'll settle down and they'll eat more calmly. Uh, again, the nursing tanks can be helpful for this, especially if you have an older baby who keeps pulling away. Um, but I just I put this other picture in here to show you that um, you know, I think that that child is uh, over a year old. And um, you certainly um, can do some nice, uh, you know, relatively uh, comfortable, discreet toddler nursing, uh, even with an older baby. Okay, and then finally, I'll just you know, leave you with positive messages um, that breastfeeding is uh, the way babies are supposed to be fed. Enjoy it. Enjoy. I love the you know, have pictures of yourself nursing. This is a, a relatively short time in the in the childhood of your of your baby. Uh, and you want to remember these moments, whether these are photos that you choose to share with with uh, family or not. Um, they're just photos that you should have in your own collection because think of how many hours you end up sitting on the couch nursing your baby. Uh, it's a special time. It's an important time. And you should have some, um, you know, some tangible uh, uh, memories to look back on years from now. Um, and and um, that you are, when you're out and about and nursing, you're also setting a positive example. You're fighting a little bit of that uh, cartoon, the Victoria's Secret uh, cartoon that I showed at the beginning and um, and reminding, you know, in some ways subtly reminding people that this is the way babies are supposed to be fed. Um, and uh, sometimes children will be curious and they'll want to know what's that baby doing? What are you doing? And, um, you know, you just simply say I'm feeding, I'm feeding my baby. You just keep it very, very practical. Uh, and if, you know, if they, if the child says, you know, how are you, how are you feeding the baby? Where's the bottle? Um, I'm feeding. I'm feeding the baby milk from my breast. You know, I mean, it's really if if their parents want to get into it in great detail, fine. But you know, you can just keep it basic. I'm feeding my baby, and that's what you're doing. 
Okay, um, so that concludes the uh, nursing in, in public segment today. Um, I put some hyperlinks up here uh, and then I will get into the questions. I see we've got a bunch of questions. Um, add the link to the calendar for next week. Next week we're going to talk about breastfeeding in the workplace. So um, not necessarily talking about you as a nursing mom returning to work. I've got several webinars on that already. I think Katie put the link up to one of them. Uh, on that same link there's um, expressing storing and feeding pumped milk which is a very technical, it's kind of like a pump talk light and then there's the one with bright horizons which talks about um, your transition back to work as a nursing mom uh, next week I'm going to talk more specifically about um, breastfeeding and the workplace like uh, lactation rooms and some of the um, current policies uh, that uh, employers should be working toward uh, with their employees to allow moms a time and a place to breastfeed. So I'll spend a few minutes on that next week. Uh, please do follow me on Twitter um, and follow Isis Parenting on Twitter and sign up for our week by week newsletter that ties in with the week of your pregnancy or the very age of your baby. Um, and um, Katie, yes, if you would change the deck now to the um, to the general breastfeeding deck, then uh, I will do that. Okay, first question. I have a just turned six month old. The last couple of weeks he's fallen asleep every time he's nursed with me. I work, so this would be only the nursings in the evening after I'm home. Is it bad to let him fall asleep while nursing like that? Is there a medical risk to him? Is it bad parenting for me? Okay. Um, you know, this is one of those questions where uh, there's no right or wrong answer and it, many, many different families and different moms are going to do it differently. Um, I would say that at six months, if you nurse your baby to sleep, if your baby then sleeps for a nice uh, long sleep stretch, uh, uh, four, five, six hours at the beginning of the night, wakes up and eats at three or four, goes back to sleep for a few more hours, wakes up and eats, goes back to sleep for another hour, um, then, you know, as long as you're getting enough sleep and it's all working for you, no problem there. Uh, the only issue really with uh, falling asleep nursing for a slightly older baby, you know, starting around four and five months, is that's when sleep associations are being developed. And so it, it you know, if and when it may become an issue would be uh, if your child begins to wake up multiple times at night and requires nursing in order to fall back asleep. If that's the case, then I would suggest separating out nursing uh, and moving that to the beginning of the bedtime routine. Generally, that's what I suggest if people are asking for a general recommendation. Sometime around uh, four or five months of age, it may be a good time to move nursing earlier in the bedtime routine. So it's not the absolute last thing that happens so that ultimately uh, if your goal is to get your baby to be sleeping uh, on his back on a firm flat surface separate from you like at a, on a bedside co-sleeper or a crib or something like that uh, then um, it's beneficial if you can get the baby to a calm and relaxed state but ultimately let them fall asleep on their own in the crib and I know that that's much easier said than done by all means I know that but um, that's you know that's ultimately what what does help with nighttime sleep in terms of sleep associations and frequent waking so your baby is going to wake multiple times at night uh, that doesn't change what does change is what they expect to happen uh, when they do wake up so ultimately you know do they need to eat each time um, as they get a little bit older, do they need some help settling down um, back to sleep sometimes, but not necessarily with food? And then as they get older still, uh, do they are they able to wake up and then settle themselves back to sleep without actually needing your intervention? And then the best part of all is when they wake up in the middle of the night, do they put themselves back to sleep eventually without you even knowing? So um, that's, you know, kind of the... Um, the, the, the way things roll out. So if, uh, if you end up having to uh, resettle your baby multiple times at night, with nursing back to sleep then uh, and the baby is is six and seven and eight months old uh, that's generally not hunger that's a sleep association um, and separating feeding from sleep can be beneficial the only other issue I would mention is um, once your baby gets a lot of teeth the recommendation is um, is to do oral hygiene you know to rinse their mouth or um, use gauze on their teeth or brush their teeth as they get older um, as they fall asleep but in all honesty uh, you know, it's not a huge deal. Um, nursing on and off all throughout the night or drinking milk from a bottle on and off all throughout the night or worse yet, uh, juice on and off throughout the night, like putting the baby into the crib with a bottle uh, is, is not good for the teeth. Uh, but aside from that, no, I wouldn't worry too much about it as long as you're sleeping. 
Um, okay, here's a question from a brand new mom. Congratulations. She says, my baby is, uh, is 13 days old. I've not been able to provide sufficient milk. I'm able to pump only half an ounce each time, and that is produced during the phase one and phase two of the pumping. Does not produce anything additional. Do I have a production problem? Not sure how to address it. I'm taking fenugreek capsules. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're working with somebody, but um, two weeks, at, at two weeks, um, you know, this is a really critical time in terms of milk production. Um, and so uh, it's essential that you stimulate full milk production either by baby or or uh, by pump if the baby is is you know not not able or willing um, and so that would mean expressing um, I'm looking for the, the right slide here eight times um, uh, that would mean uh, moving milk thoroughly frequently and thoroughly eight times in 24 hours um, if the baby latches and sucks that's great if the baby latches and falls asleep um, I would you know do that for 10 or 15 minutes because you're still going to end up needing to express so that's double pump with a hospital grade pump uh, for maybe you know uh, 12, 15, 18 minutes, um, eight times in 24 hours. That's every uh, two to three hours during the day, every three to four hours at night. Um, other questions, uh, you, you know, I would really encourage you to have a consult um, to come in and, and see one of us. Um, but uh, other um, things I would want to know about are uh, any any um, past medical history that involve endocrine, thyroid, polycystic ovarian. I'd want to know about breast changes uh, during pregnancy. Um, I'd want to do a physical exam to look at, uh, at the breast tissue, um, ask questions about your uh, postpartum bleeding, retained placenta, for example, can uh, can create uh, issues with milk production. Um, a lot of different things going on. Um, but uh, removing the milk uh, eight times in 24 hours is what's going to be required to stimulate milk production, um, and uh, you got to move the milk to make the milk. Uh, a lot of these issues um, on the baby side can impact milk production if the baby is jaundiced or sleepy, um, if they're not coming to the breast frequently enough, if there's a shallow latch that's going to make you very sore as well as not stimulate um, milk removal, uh, and then that makes the baby very sleepy, so it, it you know becomes sort of a downward spiral. Uh, oral anatomy issues, again, will make you very sore, but also impact milk removal. Um, and then on the other side, you know, if, um, if mom has uh, severe engorgement or fullness and isn't removing the milk, um, if, uh, if uh, not, 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 essentially not moving milk um, frequently enough is the most common reason uh, in the early stages for, uh, for low milk production. Um, ways to increase the supply, it's hard to know which will work better uh, without uh, a consult because uh, usually there's going to be a combination of both of these things. Um, and a lot of people who are very well-meaning breastfeeding supporters may say, oh, well, the baby always works better than, than the pump. Well, in the perfect world, that would be so. But um, if a baby has latch issues or is very sleepy uh, or is, for whatever reason, not able to stimulate and remove milk thoroughly, then uh, sometimes actually the pump works better than the baby. And if the pump uh, can stimulate production, we can feed the milk to the baby, then the baby gets you know perkier, wakes up more energy, uh, less jaundiced, and so on. Or maybe the baby is a preemie and just needs time to grow and thrive. Then the baby will gradually be able to remove milk as well as the pump, and then better than the pump. Um, but again, a baby who is essentially latched on, suckling, and, and sleeping at the breast for an hour, uh, that's barely transferring milk is not going to be as efficient as 10 minutes with a hospital grade pump. Um, double pump, hands on and hands free, that's what's going to help you out in these early days if you need to be doing that triple threat of working on the breastfeeding and then pumping and also needing to supplement the baby. You really do need to um, double pump both breasts at the same time, hands free, using a hands free bustier so that your hands are available to either supplement the baby, uh, care for or comfort your baby because uh, pumping eight times a day is not going to be easy when you're partner, caregiver, family members go home. So you need to be able to have the baby next to you and have your hands on your baby to keep your baby content. Um, and then hands on your breasts because you'll be needing to do massage and compression. Um, 
So again, to stimulate increased uh, supply, it requires working on the breastfeeding, the latch, or improving the milk transfer, pumping after breastfeeding, um, and uh, working working with your lactation consultant and the pediatrician uh, on a supplementation plan to make sure that the baby is thriving. Um, you know, dealing with any jaundice-related uh, issues and so on, um, and then a plan to begin tapering down the supplementation because that's a very tricky thing that a lot of people don't address. Is you know once you are into that pattern of supplementing, how do you begin to, to pump less and breastfeed more and bottle feed less and so on. Okay, here's a mom who says, um, I've seen a lot of info about how much milk to give in the first six months. Uh, wouldn't expect much bigger bottles than when newborn. And now that my son is older and we're starting solid foods, how do I know how much milk to give him? Are his four ounce bottles still enough, particularly given that he's sleeping during feedings in the evening? Uh, and has started waking up more at night, uh, two hours after falling asleep, plus as usual, 3 or 4 a.m. feeding. Okay, let's see. Uh, this baby, six months old, last few weeks, has fallen asleep every time he's nursed with me. Oh, I see. It's a continuation of that question. Um, what you don't want to do then is, is to get into um, what's like a reverse cycle um, feeding where you are... Um, you know, where the baby is sleeping more during the day, eating less during the day, so he becomes used to eating more at night. with solid foods, I wouldn't expect very much um, nutrition or calorie to come through solid foods uh, until he's much closer to, you know, nine, uh, eight, nine, ten months. Maybe at ten months he'll be having a few, uh, you know, two meals, three meals a day. Um, and by meal, I mean, you know, six bites of, uh, of sweet potato and four spoonfuls of, of uh, cereal and, you know, and a few bites of something else. It's not a whole lot of food. It's not a whole lot of calorie. Um, so, so oh, yeah, you could try. Uh, I guess I guess um, the thing about being able to decrease the volume of milk he's getting at night and to feel better about trying some other resettling strategies to kind of withdraw from the frequent feedings at night, uh, you would feel better doing that by uh, by increasing his milk intake during the day. So sure, you could increase his bottles to four and a half ounces or five ounces and see how he does with that. Um, and by giving him a little bit more milk during the day, I'm not suggesting that that will automatically make him uh, nurse less at night because I, I think you've got a sleep association issue um, going on, given your other question. Um, but it will make you perhaps begin to feel more comfortable down the road of sending your partner in uh, to shush and bounce him back to sleep without giving him the breast um, at the first waking, uh, which is what I would recommend um, the first time the baby wakes up to resettle him um, and uh, realizing that at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, his drive, his uh, his drive to sleep is going to be much uh, lighter and you'll have a harder time getting him to fall back asleep at that point. So uh, you'll probably have more success resettling at the beginning of the night um, without the feeding and then planning to feed at the at the uh, 3 or 4 a.m. Uh, waking. And uh, our sleep team would be happy to work with you on that. Uh, it's probably more of a sleep issue than a breastfeeding issue, although these things are, are very well uh, intertwined. Okay, I think we can take maybe one or two questions. Um, is there a trick to a good latch while side lying? Sometimes we get it right and a lot of times it's too shallow. Yes, and I have a whole webinar on um, positioning, but I think I put that slide in at the beginning here. Let's see if I can find it. I had a very willing coworker here uh, who I was able to arrange in all kinds of contortions so that I could demonstrate this. And um, here are a couple of tricks for nursing side lying, which I highly recommend uh, moms that have babies you know, that are in that kind of two month range practice. Because uh, if you can practice this during the day when the lights are on and you've got your wits about you, take off your shirt, see what you're doing, get the hang of it. And then it will be easier in the middle of the night or uh, if you're trying to nurse your baby down for a nap in the afternoon afternoon because you're exhausted and they won't settle, uh, then you can get the positioning right. And um, what you don't want to do is uh, let the baby latch on any which way and then kind of uh, roll back or recline a little bit, slide down the nipple and, and make you sore. So uh, my suggestion is to put a, a, 
body pillow if you have one behind your back, put another pillow between your legs and then another small pillow under your head and make sure you use a rolled up receiving blanket which you can see in the picture here. I call those uh, receiving blanket sausages when you just take a blanket and roll it up into a sausage and that tucked behind your baby's back when your baby is laying on his side is going to be very helpful because it keeps the baby snugged close to you and it prevents the baby from uh, rolling onto his back while he's latched on and that kind of draws him a little further down the nipple and makes you sore, which you don't want. So by keeping him on his side uh, with that rolled up receiving blanket behind him, uh, it will help the positioning. Um, and um, yeah, when you're when you're nursing on the bottom breast, uh, you're going to lean back onto the body pillow a little bit, and that exposes your bottom breast. And then you can uh, see what you're doing. And um, when you're nursing on the bottom breast, you kind of want to take your baby's bum and snug it a little bit closer to your thighs. Uh, and then when you're ready to switch, you can actually nurse on the top breast without rolling over and without turning the baby onto the other side. And the way to do that is to shift your hips back and roll forward towards your baby. Um, um, and um, in that position, uh, you're going to be relying more on the pillow between your legs for your comfort. Uh, but that's what I would suggest. All right, it looks like it's 20 of, which means uh, it's more than time to go. Um, I would encourage you guys to uh, put the webinar on your schedule, on your calendar for next week so that you'll remember to come back. Please help us spread the word. We, we do keep count um, and, um, and uh, always like to see a full house here. Um, and uh, always curious to know where people are coming in from as well. Um, let's see, what else did I have to mention? Uh, for those of you in the in the greater Boston area, I know we have Salt Marsh Pottery uh, coming to the Needham Center on Saturday, and that's an awesome thing to do with your young baby if you haven't done that yet. They make beautiful uh, heirloom quality, uh, um, really nice uh, kind of ceramic hand-painted, hand-print and footprint mementos. And uh, these make great gifts for the grandparents with the holidays coming up. You can make a, a, an ornament or a paperweight or something like that for the grandparents. Um, and aside from that, I think that about does it for me. Katie, thank you so much for being in the chat room today. And um, I will see everybody back next week. Happy nurturing, everybody. Bye-bye.